Good afternoon. It is an honor to be at this conference. And I wanted to introduce myself to just say a little bit of background. One of, one of my many inspirations for getting involved in the work of the spiritual care program and of this new curriculum called Compassionate Presence came from a personal experience. After my first husband died, I was complaining to an acquaintance who was a doctor about some of the more difficult, painful, additional suffering that we went through from being told the news about his terminal diagnosis in a very unfeeling and brusque way that was almost traumatic for us. And other ways that we felt in the year of his dying, um, the care was less than authentic, less than compassionate. And this doctor said to me, you don't understand what our training is like. He said, the ones who come into medical school with a heart, with a wish to really care and open their heart to others, feel that it's gradually destroyed. Their empathy is, is diminished. They, the ones who survive the dehumanizing effect of this training are the ones who are well defended and can't connect with their patients or the family members. And just hearing that story made a big transformation of the anger that I'd been carrying about what happened to a feeling of compassion. I wanted to do something to change that culture, to offer other alternatives, other ways for people who work in the fields of healthcare and social work to find that they could work in a more meaningful and caring way without having to always be defended. So I got involved in the hospice movement for many years and then began to work with Sogya Rinpoche because after the publication of the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, many healthcare professionals asked him, could we get a non-denominational training that would help us apply the profound insights that are in your book and the methods that are in your book in our work to help us with these very difficult and challenging situations? So as a result, 20 years ago, I helped to establish the Spiritual Care Program, which now runs in eight countries and has reached over 30,000 people. And our first emphasis in the trainings was on end-of-life care. And in fact, and I'm, I'm telling you a little bit about what we do. It's also in relation to what I'm going to say in the talk. Um, we've been offering now for 10 years in collaboration with Naropa University a five-month intensive training in com contemplative end-of-life care. It's part online and part residential. And our work has expanded beyond the scope of end-of-life care because, again, professionals who work in fields of health care and social work in diverse fields, such as addiction care, working in pediatrics and so forth, they're benefiting from a new curriculum that we just uh, created two years ago, which is called Compassion and Presence. And that's what this talk is going to be about, how to integrate the effects of our meditation, mindfulness, and compassion practice into actually how we listen to and support others. And what I want to talk about today is the benefits of that. I'm, I have to get used to PowerPoint here. So the three things I'm going to cover is first describing what is compassionate presence, what, how do we train in it, and then research that shows the benefits for healthcare staff, the benefits for the patient or client, as well as the benefits for the organization. Now, Dr. Balfour Mount is the father of the modern palliative care movement. In fact, he coined the term. And in 1973, he founded the first palliative care service in North America in Montreal. And he's a practitioner of Christian meditation in the tradition of Dom John Maine. And recently, this is what he said, our effectiveness as healers is determined by our openness, self-awareness, and capacity for radical presence. It is how we are present to one another that counts. Curiously, humility and silence trump theoretical expertise as we accompany one another on the all-important journey of discovery toward the inner peace that is our neurobiologic birthright. So, why is compassionate presence not called compassionate care? Well, that phrase already has built-in problems. For example, there's a sense in compassionate care that there's me giving something to you. It creates a relationship that is imbalanced and unequal, a sense of a helper and a helped. 
It's also the basis of a very high self-expectation as well as a negative self-evaluation when we realize we fail to be compassionate and it can lead to a sense of compassion burnout. So, how do we define compassionate presence? Well, it's not about giving compassion to somebody else. It's more about where the care is coming from. It's a way of being. And it requires a radical shift from doing to simply being. Now, we use the word presence a lot. We think, well, if we're present in a room, then we're present, right? But what we describe in this kind of training is that presence is actually describing that we apply the methods of meditation and compassion to help us deeply connect with our essence or true nature, the best part of our being. And we bring this way of being when we listen to or support others. It's a non-judging openness and kindness. There's nothing to solve or fix. It takes no time. It's effortless and yet very effective. Because more than anything we do or say, what helps somebody who's suffering is how we are. Well, this image to me says it all. It's a little bit what you would call selflessness, being free of ourself, our ordinary entangled mind that is always looking with hope and fear about how am I doing in this equation. And Gerard, a, a doctor from France, told me about a difficult, challenging situation where he realized he could apply something from the training he'd taken with us into his care work. He said, the first time I was asked to visit Alzheimer's patients with behavioral problems, I went away feeling very, very troubled. He said, it brought up my deepest fear. I wanted to just run out of the room. I had no control over the situation. There was nothing I could do or say, nothing I could fix. There was no way I could help. And deep down, I knew that one day I might also end up that helpless and confused. Jared told me that what helped him overcome his fear was that he started to realize that not only him, but the man with Alzheimer's also had a wish to be free of suffering and fear. That not only him, but the patient also wanted to be happy and to feel safe and loved. So this helped to release him from his preoccupation about himself and whether or not he could succeed or fail with his patient. And he connected again with his fundamental goodness and with his selfless, compassionate motivation to be of service to the patient he was caring for. And he realized that's what he needed to bring to this confused man with Alzheimer's. So the next day, sitting with a patient, medically unable to do anything, but just sending the man his genuine, fearless compassion helped to make the patient calm, but it helped the doctor too. Well, when the family returned to the room, they said to him, you are a very skilled doctor. You must have a lot of experience with Alzheimer's patients, as this was his first, by the way. He said, we don't know what you are doing, but please keep doing it. Our father is very calm now. So Gerard told me that by realizing he could be present with his patients this way, turned what had been his deepest fear into the source of his greatest joy and strength. So, how do we train in compassionate presence? Well, I want to talk about some of the basic premises of our training, but also the methodologies. First of all, compassionate presence begins with our self. When we are present to ourselves, we can be present for others. The second is that genuine compassion is innate within everyone, and it can also be cultivated. And the next, I want to say a little bit more, that beyond our external appearance, we all have within us a core or essence, which is what has been described as this fundamental goodness. And so the starting point in relating to somebody else is understanding that everybody that we relate with as well is fundamentally good, perfect, and whole, just as they are, just as we are. So... The more we are in contact with and confident in this aspect of who we are, we experience more ease and natural kindness in how we relate with others, but also in how we relate with ourselves. And what people in the training discover is that presence itself can be surprisingly effective, healing and supportive for others. 
and we can feel nourished at the end of the day rather than drained. Well, one doctor who took this five-month uh, contemplative end-of-life care training through our collaboration with Naropa University wrote some of his feedback. He said, more than just patching somebody up, it's about allowing my true essence that comes from my heart to shine forward. He added, some days, of course, I feel very tired or stressed, but what I've learned in this course is how to renew every day. That's the transformation. It's an allowing for more spaciousness, less reactivity, less judgments, and how to not hold on to things that are impermanent anyway. Now I can sit with a patient with a more clear and open heart and really be with them. And I come away refreshed. So what are our methodologies? Well, I, I forgot to mention this at the beginning, but there have actually been four research projects done on the trainings that spiritual care is offered, and mo most recently one on the Compassionate Presence course, the curriculum that we've just um, developed in Munich in June, but the, the research is not completed yet, so it hasn't been published, but there are two that have been published, so I'll be talking about a couple today. So methodology. Meditation and mindfulness exercises to develop awareness and presence. Contemplative methods for deepening compassion and self-healing, which reduce stress and bring a sense of joy, confidence, and fulfillment to care work. And this is a key element of the compassion and presence training, that you not only learn the methods to help you connect with awareness, mindfulness, and compassion, but you're immediately given exercises to integrate them into listening and into authentic communication. So methods for applying contemplative listening and communication to connect with people in crisis and create a healing environment. Exercises of integrating meditation, mindfulness, and compassion in various fields of work and practical understanding of the contemplative and spiritual care training model. So now I want to talk about what are the benefits of, and that's the title of the talk, what are the benefits of integrating compassionate presence into health care? And I want to start with a quote from the Dalai Lama, he wrote, and the practice of healing a kind heart is as valuable as medical training because it is the source of happiness for both oneself and others. Not only do other people respond to kindness when medicine is ineffective, but cultivating a kind heart is a cause of our own good health. So that's the first level of benefits I want to talk about. What are the benefits for the healthcare staff themselves? Well, in 2002, there was a three-and-a-half-day training on compassionate end-of-life care that the spiritual care program gave to medical and social work professionals working in the field of palliative care in Munich. Dr. Gian Barazio, director of a palliative care service, researched the immediate and sustained benefits of this training, which was published in the Journal of Palliative Medicine in 2005. Participants were asked to identify their main problems in the care of the dying and the family, and you can see them on the screen. Their own uncertainty, communication difficulties, handling difficult family members, and their own emotions. And I think some of you who work in other fields besides palliative care can relate to these main difficulties at work. What are the results? Six months later, 77 of the respondents experienced that their coping on these issues had been improved through the training. And there were significant improvements in self-perceived compassion for the dying, compassion for themselves, the attitude towards their family, the attitudes toward their colleagues improved. They had less burnout, less stress at their work, and more satisfaction with their work. What are the benefits for the patients or clients? Can doctors learn empathy, or is empathy something one is born with? This is a question that researchers asked in Boston Two years ago, it's been published in the Journal of Internal Medicine now. They observed that residents going through medical training had decreased levels of empathy. So in this study, they took 100 doctors in training and asked the patients themselves to evaluate the level of empathy that the doctors um, displayed. And half the doctors took part in three one-hour training, empathy training sessions, including learning to read Paul Ekman's facial expressions they also learned behavioral tools to convey empathetic understanding and concern. They asked the patients later to evaluate the, do the doctors again. And those who took the training showed improvements, and those who had not actually got worse at empathizing with patients. 
Compared with their peers, doctors who went through the course interrupted their patients less, maintained better eye contact, and were better able to maintain their equanimity if patients became angry, frustrated, or upset. One doctor who was writing about this study in the New York Times said she decided to try out some of these methods of maintaining eye contact with her patients rather than the computer screen, of observing changes in the people's face and voice modulations. And she said, it became a little bit hard because I was juggling all the diagnosis and possible research that had to be done. But in the end, I realized I was enjoying my work. It was what I originally came to medicine to do. And she said, one of the patients pulled me aside at the end of the day and said, thanks, doc. I have never felt so listened to before. So what are the benefits for the organization? Well, last year, there was a project done called Het Licht van Afscheid, which is the Dutch title of my book, Facing Death and Finding Hope. And there was a, a, this, the staff at this uh, hospice in Alkmaar in North Holland, some of them took, uh, entered a reading group that were studying my book over three months. Some of them took a five-day residential training in compassionate end-of-life care. And data was collected before, during, and nine months later. And the results were quite similar to what you saw in the Munich study that I described. But I want to talk about the organizational benefits. The spiritual counselor described one year later, certainly in the first weeks after the training, it could be felt. The participants shared enthusiastically with those who hadn't joined. Indeed, I have the feeling that it ripples through in various ways. The bonds with those who participated are still there, and people share that they still use the methods that they learned, both at home and in the hospice. And another, the volunteer coordinator described that the training has been talked about a lot, and they even have been using counsel, which is a contemplative listening method for group settings, with a very stressful team meeting by the doctors. And she said, I can't say the complete atmosphere has changed, but certainly I find it easier to name spirituality and keep it on the agenda. I believe many seeds have been planted and will continue harvesting for quite some time. So, do organizations benefit from staff training and compassionate presence? Well, this needs more research, and we hope that other organizations will invite us to come in and train their teams so we can look at the benefits that come. However, undoubtedly, the organizations do benefit because healthcare staff real, realize the value of and enjoy caring for themselves. They feel increased compassion for themselves as well as for their patients, and they have a higher sense of satisfaction in their jobs. And the benefits of empathy training have been found to go far beyond the exam room. Greater physician empathy and empathetic communication skills well, you can see on the screen, have led to fewer medical errors, better patient outcomes, more satisfied patients, that includes all of us, of course, decreased burnout, fewer malpractice claims, and happier doctors. So the bottom line is this kind of training will ensure that any organization's staff are happier, healthier, that their patients are compliant, perhaps that means getting better more easily, and the patients are more satisfied. So it can only benefit them and save them money. Now, we didn't talk about the benefits for the family. That hasn't been researched in either. However, I myself have been a family member. My first husband was dying, and now recently my, sec my third husband died. But I think it's best summed up, the benefits for the family, in this quote I want to share, you, share with you from Aung San Suu Kyi when she accepted her Nobel Peace Prize. She said, of all the sweets of adversity, and let me say they are not numerous, I have found the most precious of all is a lesson I have learned on the value of kindness. Every kindness I receive, small or big, convinced me that there could never be enough of it in our world. To be kind is to respond with sensitivity and human warmth to the hopes and needs of others. Even the briefest touch of kindness can lighten a heavy heart. Kindness can change the lives of people. So thank you all very much.